Hi, I'm Tatiana, and I'm a private investigator. My other partner, FBI. My other partner, fraud examiner. I'm Vincent Parker. I'm a private investigator. I've been a private investigator for 36 years. Prior to that, I worked for the government. I worked for the Office of Professional Discipline and the Office of Professional Medical Conduct. My name is Manny Gomez. I'm a retired FBI agent. Before that, I was a sergeant with the New York City Police Department. And before that, I was a United States Marine and served in the infantry. I have been an investigator for approximately almost 14 years. Uh, in my line of work, we do everything, anywhere from custody cases to fraud to missing person. But I want to focus today on fraud. Fraud is taking money meant for one thing and putting it somewhere else. Very simple. My definition of fraud is a cowardly act of a thief. Fraud is one of the biggest concerns in our society right now. No matter where you go, there's fraud being perpetrated. Uh, land fraud, uh, financial securities fraud, uh, Bernie Madoff type of fraud, all kinds of stuff. The thing that bothers me is nonprofit organizations committing fraud. Fraud is a deliberate deception for a gain, usually a monetary gain. Uh, it is a nonviolent crime that affects multiple people uh, more than violent crimes. Sometimes with private organizations such as nonprofit, it's, um, it's where you're supposed to donate to a cause, let's say ALS or um, let's say to the homeless. You, you do these things and so people will give checks or cash to these um, nonprofit organizations and these nonprofit are supposed to go ahead and supply that money, not for themselves, and supply it for these people. A nonprofit organization doesn't pay taxes because they're supposed to be doing good for the community, good for the, an organization. And it's very hard sometimes to prove that because they are a nonprofit. So it's hard to go ahead and say, oh, they're stealing. But then when you start to investigate things like this sometimes, you start to see, wait a minute, they said they were gonna feed the homeless over here, or they said that, and you show up, they're not there, or these people, the homeless or whoever, say, hey, they haven't been here, they haven't helped us. And then it takes someone like us to investigate that and just, wow, where is this money going? And what happens is they get carried away with the, all the money that they collect. And they have a tendency of stealing the money. It's a very horrible feeling because people want to give to help other causes. And when you have someone like this pocketing it for themselves, and especially when they already have money, it just makes you, um, it makes you furious. They put people on the payroll that don't exist they put vendors on the payroll that don't exist. For example, uh, we had a case in the Bronx, a pretty famous case, where the politician had a nonprofit. And with the nonprofit, he put a lot of people on, on, on payroll. Now, this was political fraud. They put people on there because they helped them get elected. It was a payoff. They have a relative on the payroll as an administrator. And it got so bad that the amount of money that they were contributing let's say cancer organization, was minimal because all the money was going to administrative costs. And that's the problem with nonprofits. Politicians love nonprofits. They use it, obviously, for political gain. And they're able to put a lot of people on the payroll so that they can get more contributions so they get reelected. And it's an ongoing thing. It's, it's never ending. It just keeps going on and on until the feds or the state investigators investigate and arrest them. This is an historic moment. A federal investigation has found $187 million raised in donations to four separate cancer charities has largely gone not to cancer survivors, not to cancer research, but somewhere else entirely. Donald Trump comes in and he tells his son and the charity, uh, I know that you're doing a good thing. I know that this is for kids with cancer, but you're holding this in my course and we're gonna charge you. When you look at it, you're taking money that starts as one intent, starts as charity money given to an organization, and on the other end, it becomes revenue for a company. A leaked email reveals some of the cost of Chelsea Clinton's wedding may have been offset with charitable funds from the Clinton Foundation. The explosive charge comes from former Clinton intimate Doug Band. Fraud is like a triangle, if you can imagine that. You have opportunity, you have motive, then you have rationalization. Not-for-profits is a well-known fact that a lot of them commit fraud. Uh, a lot of them 
open up as what the federal statute is, 501c3, which is a not-for-profit, uh, and basically open up their doors to get money from victims, while the intention of what they want to uh, offer is not really being done. Or they'll take a dollar and for every dollar they spend 90 cents in administrative fees, which is technically not fraud, but is still being disingenuous with the public. And some of them are just outright fraudulent, where every dollar that they take, they just keep for themselves. So sometimes when I go um, undercover in these organizations, um, I know first that hand, because I'll be wearing a camera, um, like a small, it looks like a, a button, and I'll go in as one of the volunteers to uh, help out with this organization. And I will see certain money processed. Or I'll make sure that I'm working the area where the money is processed. And we have a goal, let's say, for the organization. We want to raise $10,000 that day. And I know where because we count the money. And then uh, we usually count it three times per se through the checks, everything. So sometimes when I, I make sure that I'm with somebody who's counting and then they said, Oh, we raised uh, eight thousand dollars today. Okay, and then also when we do the second count, oh yeah, we raised you know sixty eight hundred dollars today. So wait a minute, uh uh, because I have to count it. Two other people have to count it. So that means somebody out of this is you know lying or taking the money. So then when we get down to the final number, oh, we raised five thousand dollars today. Yay! Wait a minute, where's the other five thousand dollars that I know was there? So you see at first hand how easy this is. Um, especially with cash. We have one investigation right now where a nonprofit is a dance recital company, and I look at their filings each year, they have to file taxes, and it has to go to the Attorney General's office. And I look at it and I see that the same expenditure every year is for rent when they don't have a place, they don't have an office. They're using their apartment, they're using personal expenses, they're using the nonprofit as a cash cow. I am on the board of directors of the sleepaway camp of kids with cancer. We watch every penny. We get receipts for everything. We don't want any problems with any government agency or anybody. Now, I wish everybody would do that, but they don't. So part of this organization was, is this was a homeless uh, one. And this got me even more involved with the homeless because they were supposed to accept uh, clothing donation, food, um, shoes, et cetera, et cetera. And I know because I would have to count everything and some would be brand new. So some of the old shoes or the old outfits would be in the bucket to give, but the new stuff would be gone. And yes, it's not cash necessarily. Sometimes people belong to these organizations not to help others. They belong to get something for themselves. It's a con game. It, it, it is a game of confidence where the perpetrator can't gain the confidence of the victim to commit the fraud and thus the crime. I'm in this hotel and uh, I have to call this lady because she stole $1.5 million. She just came from Turkey, but she came on private jet, of course. So now there's a nice rich hotel here in the city and I had five outfits. Um, I dressed up as like Muslim outfit. I dressed up as a uh, like street walker. Then I dressed up in business suit. Then I dressed up just like a mom, like pregnant, nice, you know. So I held conversation as I followed this woman around. Then we ended up visually sitting next to each other and having conversation. Why was she there? Blah, blah, blah. Small talk, this and that. Then we actually went to a club together, a nice Russian club. And we danced and we ate. She introduced me to a friend of hers. Oh, it was fun time. But eventually, I found out where she put this money because she bragged about it. And then after that, I had uh, the local authorities come. And they arrested her and took the money. What's funny is she talked to me with two different looks and she never knew it was me, like never. When I read in the newspaper how an organization or people in an organization stole money from a nonprofit organization, it, it breaks my heart. Sometimes they try to put the money back from different ways, but it doesn't work that way. You steal the money, you, you keep the money, you spend it. Then how are you gonna put the money back? Not-for-profits, they have a long history of being uh, fraudulent or attacked attempting fraudulent activities. What the bookkeeper was doing was very clever, but we caught him, was taking the blank money orders, Xeroxing them, and putting them in the, in, into the books, but taking the actual money order and making it out to himself. And how he 
balance the, the, uh, the checkbook was he would ask for operating expenses for that building from another account and put that in. So he had a book balance, except that eventually we realized that the expenditures from the operating account were out of line, was really out of line. So I interviewed him and um, I asked him, I said, um, you must have took about $250,000. He, he goes, yes, I did. We found out later it was 450,000, but the books that we had at the time showed about a quarter of a million dollars. So he gave a confession, very simple, wrote a, wrote a confession, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Uh, I'll, cut, I'll give you some back of some of the money. I got $12,000 back for the client. That was it. The rest of the money he spent, he bought a house in Dominican Republic, electronic toys, uh, clothes, all kinds of stuff. I'm on the board of several organizations, the Latin, National Law Enforcement Associates, uh, American Society of International Security. Uh, I'm also on the board of uh, American Association of Professional Law Enforcement. And all these educations try to educate people and to promote and foster a better understanding of how to protect themselves from being victims of crimes such as fraud. I am a volunteer uh, and I'm on the board of directors of an organization called Sleepaway Camp for Children with Cancer. It, it breaks my heart to see kid, little kids with cancer and uh, sometimes the expenses of the treatment and the hospitalization is overwhelming for the parents. What we do is we take them away for a camp for a week. And uh, it's a nice feeling to see the kid have a, a week away from a hospital, uh, away from other people with cancer, and have a, just to have a great time. We enjoy ourselves having a fundraiser, but we have to be careful with the money. We got to make money on a fundraiser. We don't spend it on ourselves. It's very gratifying to see the mothers and fathers are more appreciative than the children because they're at wit's end sometimes and sometimes these kids die uh, shortly thereafter we, we take them to a camp so it's, it's heartbreaking but it's, it's a good thing to do for them. These organizations are important to me because as a law enforcement officer and now as a security professional they are key organizations in this city in this state and in this country that promote the latest protocols uh, in terms of what is going on to protect individuals against fraud and other crimes and to develop new techniques in order to continue to be proactive in fighting crime in general. And my organization to belong to is, um, right now I'm currently um, doing a um, founding for ALS. I also belong to the overnight program, which is a suicide prevention. Um, I also go on the weekends and I feed the homeless. My daughter and I, we cook here at home. We bring them cupcakes, pasta, etc. It's very important to me to give back to my community and uh, important for me to do this with my daughter as well. One of the reasons that the nonprofits are, uh, are easy to be defrauded is because there's a lot of trust involved. You know, people volunteer, uh, they, they try to give their time to help the organization, but sometimes those are the ones that are, that are stealing because they, they volunteer for that one reason, to get in for the money. I don't like to just drop off the food. I actually will sit and eat with them. Um, I was homeless growing up. Uh, we moved around a lot. My mother didn't have a lot of money. Um, we stayed in shelters. Uh, we stayed in this, that. And then when I was 14, I left home. And uh, it was about the first year about the first year or so, I was homeless, bouncing around, sleeping in parks. I used to sleep on my school roof and then go down and wash myself up in the bathroom and go to school and no one knew. Um, I was never late though for school. Um, but uh, as time went on, I see people on the street and I, their background, I don't know how they got there. Uh, I don't know what they do, but it's not of my concern. Suicide Foundation is hits home a lot because um, there's people in my family that battle depression and depression is something that's scary because it's where you take your own life. You're thinking that either you don't feel good enough or you don't feel loved or wanted, even though you know that maybe your parents love you, your sister loves you, etc. but you just, the self-worth makes you feel really low and it's a chemical imbalance. So I belong to this program and they do a walk every month and the walk is called Out of the Darkness because we start 
at uh, like at night, uh, seven at night or so, and then we walk all the way until seven in the morning. The third foundation I'm working on is ALS. The profile of someone who defrauds other people, who commits fraud, usually someone that uh, has money problems. One of the things that we do is when there's a, a, a problem in a company and they don't know who the person is, we do a background check on all the individuals that would have access to that particular um, checkbook or that particular wire um, at, or credit cards and see how their finances are. And when you find the person that's really in debt, normally, man, 90% of the time, that's the person. The typical kind of person that actually does um, fraud or identity theft, it, this to me, it literally could be anyone. The average size of fraud could be from $100 to $10 million. Look at Marty Madoff, $50 billion, okay? So the average size of fraud is anything. Um, the profile of a fraudster, usually highly intelligent, um, motivated for themselves, egotistical, feeling that they're not being adequately appreciated. So they steal. They want to, sometimes they just want to get over on the system. They want to beat the system. It's very simple. Well, I'm going to beat the system. It's something that motivates them. How you can prevent from different organizations, let's say, of theft. There's no, I don't want to say there's a way to really prevent it because there isn't. Um, but how we could go ahead and observe it a little bit better is by doing no cash, just do checks, make sure that there's a write-off, make sure that we're keeping this on our taxes, make sure that we have a tax ID. If you donate, make sure you do a tax ID, you ask for a, um, a write-off so that that is turned into the IRS, so they trace it back to the organization. Sometimes they want to use their, their brains. They, they're smart people. Some of them are very smart, but they all make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, and that's how they get caught. The city of New York, the state of New York, and certainly the federal government have agencies in place that their sole function is to audit not-for-profit organizations, investigate not-for-profit organizations, to ensure that the money that they are receiving meets the standards of the 501c3 law and rules that govern not-for-profit organizations and that none of the money is being embezzled fraudulently. You know, one of the problems we have sometimes is uh, you're investigating someone who's very wealthy and they're still stealing. And um, we call that the Thomas Crown Affair syndrome it's from the movie, The Thomas Crown Affair, where the rich man, who was a billionaire, would go out and steal art and steal money and steal. I don't know if we want to call it a fetish or weakness in their system but sometimes people just want more and more. And sometimes the, the thrill of being able to get over and to get away with something. The motivation to steal from a not-for-profit is that it's fairly easy. You could set up, anybody could set up a not-for-profit, apply for 501c3 status, and as long as you meet the guidelines of uh, a not-for-profit, you could start one yourself. The, 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 the problem is that there is a lot of potential there to take the money fraudulently, to say that it's going towards the cause that you're donating to, when in reality it's going to the pockets of those administrators that are running that not-for-profit. You have people that are poor doing it, you have people that are rich that are doing it, you have people that are smart doing it, people that are stupid doing it, people are doing it. And the whole idea of preventing it is prevention. So the temptation is always there, and it's fairly easy to do so because there's not a lot of oversight from within the organization. That's why the state and the country, the federal government, has had to create these agencies in order to pre prevent them from doing this and created audits and oversight to prevent fraud within the not-for-profit. Taking the risk out of the workplace, checks and balances, uh, make sure that your computer uh, doesn't have too many people have access to the computer. Make sure that uh, your vendors are all vetted, that the vendors are all legitimate. Develop uh, security programs for your checks, wires, uh, have a protocol for wire, wiring money out of the company. A deal, have a deal with your bank. Deal with the bank and have the bank say, listen, anything goes out of kilter and we want to know about it.
I think the system is upside down. You have a young person that gets caught with drugs, either selling or using, and they could do years in hardcore prison. But you have a white collar criminal who's highly educated, wealthy, uh, and commits fraud and hurts uh, hundreds if not thousands of people directly or indirectly by his or her criminal fraudulent act and they get a slap on the hand and they basically go to a what they call a country club jail uh, for fraction of the time that they send somebody who does a crime like drugs or certainly a violent crime. So remember everybody's a target foundations you me but you just need to be more aware. Recently, there was a case where um, someone in a nonprofit organization got caught with their hand in a chicken jar. And they confessed, they, it was a whole big thing, they got arrested, but the impact on the organization was terrible. People did not trust the organization, they lost their reputation. So people are not going to donate money to an organization that's tainted. So that's another bad part of, of fraud. It could affect the organization after the fraud has been found. So there's an organization called the American Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, which trains and certifies certified fraud examiners, which could then detect fraud. They just came out with their latest report in 2016 of all the organizations, including not-for-profit organizations, that have been uh, frequenting and doing fraudulent acts. And uh, that's something that if you're going to donate to a not-for-profit, you should definitely look at that website and that organization in order to see if the not-for-profit that you are considering donating to uh, is on that list. So what happens with these organizations after they are busted or et cetera, they have a bad reputation and you don't wanna give back, but don't let that ruin the way that you look at wanting to give to organization. Remember, local government, uh, websites, reviews, YouTube, etc. Use your social media to your advantage because it's not just there to um, chat with your friends and family. It's also there to do your homework and your research. So you be the investigator, not just me. For the future, an investigator, a fraud examiner must be aware of new trends and new things that might be happening. Uh, we have such great uh, scientific breakthroughs and the scientific breakthroughs are fodder for fraud. Look, any other object that's either sold, bartered, or given some sort of value, someone's going to find a way to defraud that organization or that, that company or that group that has this product. A good investigator has to keep aware of any new trends and anything else that might be coming up. I get scared sometimes uh, with this job because depending on the cases, say if somebody's doing fraud and they embezzled a lot of money, someone like me goes ahead and busts them, they're gonna be angry. So sometimes people think, wait, 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 they're gonna maybe kill you. Sometimes it's somebody like this because you're taking everything away. Time goes on, more government regulation and more auditing by government agencies will help ensure that not-for-profits are legitimate. I hope this helps um, you from getting any kind of fraud or doing fraud to somebody because I will catch you.